So you may or may not recognize uh, State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy now because he's got a brand new look. Hey, Tacky. Hey, Joe. Uh, glad to be here and uh, sharing my summer cut at the beginning of fall. I, amazingly, you look even younger after your haircut. I don't know how that's possible, but you do. <laughs> well, I think I'm, I'm one of the few uh, electeds that doesn't seem to age quickly in elected life. Uh, I remember a few years in into uh, elected office, I got people asking how my hair wasn't turning white so quickly. So uh, a combination of very good genetics and uh, uh, being single, I think, may help too. <laughs> I think a lot of people might agree with that, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we should tell the story about about um, your haircut, just because it's a microcosm of what's going on in the in the economy as a, as a whole. Um, you know, small uh, business people are, are struggling to adapt to this new way of life, um, barbers being one of them. Absolutely. Uh, my, my hair uh, guy I've uh, used since I was 20 years old, so we have a very long and, and friendly relationship. Uh, with him, and I'm very fortunate that way. And he's lost about a third of his business uh, through COVID, in combination of cut of hours, uh, challenges of clients coming in, reduced clients, and of course, just trepidation of clients, uh, which is a big issue, and uh, enforcing the mask requirement as well. You, know, you turn away customers if they're not going to comply with, with the health standards, and they're taking it very seriously. He maintains two sets of scissors, two sets of combs, he has the food disinfectants, which is causing him uh, more money. Um, so he's taking extremely cautious. And he's willing to cut people's hair outdoors. We figure it out somehow. Um, and he's willing to cut around my mask. So I can keep my mask on the entire time uh, with no difficulty uh, while he's cutting it. And we did outside in the yard. I fortunately have an outdoor plug. So he was able to uh, you know, put his buzz uh, clippers in. And uh, we, did, we skipped the wash, unless you want to put the, put the hose to me. <laughs> uh, you know, at this point, <laughs> we did that. And he, he was very thankful for the pandemic insurance, too. I mean, he received extra uh, $600 a week, which helped him pay his rent, helped him float by. Um, he had some uh, family issues he had to take care of, which gave him an opportunity to uh, provide some assistance to his family. Um, but, I mean, at the same time, though, he was getting tired of not working uh, on top of everything else. And uh, obviously, when work came up, he took it right away once things started to reopen. Um, and unfortunately, in his situation, uh, he lost one of his parents to COVID, uh, who had a lot of previous health condition problems as well. So um, the pandemic insurance also helped him out on uh, care uh, when he was dealing with um, the passing of uh, one of his parents, uh, who already had broken her hip, had uh, respiratory problems, had all these issues prior, and COVID was just over the edge. And he himself had the COVID experience where he lost his sense of taste. He lost his sense of, um, you know, a lot of um, stomach problems, diarrhea, high fever. Um, his sister got it. Um, his other parent got it. Uh, but they survived. But it was a miserable two weeks. Uh, very fortunate. It was relatively mild symptoms where it's kind of norovirus plus high fever and no sense of taste and smell. Um, and, uh, you know, they quarantined, they isolated. They disinfect throughout their illness. On top of being ill, they're just cleaning everything. Um, so, you know, very you know, fortunate for you know, they didn't suffer any long-term effects, but they had a first-hand experience on top of, you know, being out of work. Um, and he, you know, he's been laid off before, but you know, nothing like this. You know. Right. What? So, what is the current, I guess, status of unemployment in, in Massachusetts in terms of uh, the timeline and, and the funding that's available now? Well, the president had extended another three hundred dollars, but provided the states participate with another hundred dollar match, which Massachusetts has done. It took a while, I think, for people to figure out what exactly the president was talking about, where the funding would come from. Well, this is the part that kind of disturbs me a little. He took the money out of the FEMA money, so he took the Federal Emergency Management Act money, and uh, those of us who pay higher insurance premiums on our homes on the coastline because of the flood zone should not be happy with this because that money is for natural disaster relief. Um, and you see all the hurricanes hitting the South Coast, the Gulf Coast. Uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of our money that uh, people pay here goes to FEMA accounts head south to those major strict uh, regions. And he's taking money out of those accounts that is meant to help people who are now homeless, lost their homes, 
to to be able to um, put them up temporarily someplace while they figure out what to do next and rebuild their homes and neighborhoods. So the pandemic insurance that the president extended is, is not too much money. It's, it's pretty much good to early October, uh, potentially, on a national level, because I only think it's, it's under, I'm trying to remember, I don't think it's more than $40 billion, but I, I think I may be wrong on that. Um, and that, that's not going to last that long um, on a $300 or $200 Fed and $100 match, which also impacts our employment trust fund too. Our trust fund's paid by uh, payroll taxes. Uh, it's one of the things that employers pay uh, for your employee. If you don't pay unemployment insurance tax and you lay off an employee, the employer is responsible for 100% of the cost of unemployment, which is why they pay unemployment insurance. Um, and, uh, you know, it, over the years, the legislature, not just us, but other states, has suspended the increase of those payroll taxes, which keeps the trust fund from reaching 100%. I think our trust fund was at 57% when the pandemic hit, uh, if, if we reach a recession level unemployment. And of course, this is beyond any recession level. Um, so last I looked before the pandemic hit, it was like $1.4 trillion ish, give or take, in uh, employment insurance. You think that's a lot of money until you think about how many people are unemployed and you sign up to do 60% of the salary. It adds up really fast and it drains extremely fast. And with Massachusetts unemployment rate still floating around 7, 17%. Part of that is the um, uh, people who are contractors, independent employees, gig workers, so to speak, uh, self businesses who um, do not pay unemployment insurance. And the federal government's picking up that share of the unemployment trust fund uh, cost. But you know, if the economy doesn't turn around at some level um, and we continue to pay unemployment benefits on a um, regular schedule on our part of the trust fund, uh, we will have to borrow from the federal government and be part of our debt service. Uh, we've done this before uh, in the 08 recession. Um, so it's not something new, but this is a very different circumstance. So again, you know, to keep our economy moving, people need to wear their masks, hygiene, if you're sick, don't show up, you know, do curbside pickup. If you provide mailing service, use your local business curbside or mailing service. Um, you know, I'm sure many businesses are very accommodating on trying to catch you what you need, uh, if you need to buy it. Uh, but most importantly, only we can keep each other healthy to keep our economy alive. Yeah, I think a lot of people are kind of holding their breath waiting to see uh, with schools uh, poised to go back into session, how that's gonna impact um, the status of the pandemic, if you will. Well, you saw Dedham had already had a cluster incident. Um, New Hampshire, when the schools in Wyndham, New Hampshire had incident before they even opened schools. Um, this is, of course, causing a lot of general concern with people because even then I open schools, you know, young people are not paying attention, having parties. And you see this on college campuses, even locally, where, you know, I would expect better judgment from uh, college students in our own state. But clearly, uh, that's not the case where they become many super spreaders. And most of them don't have major symptoms and they just, they just go about this and they're losing tuition. Um, they're not getting their refunds. Um, schools are not taking this lying down. Um, you are not, they don't want to put people at risk, whether it be uh, administrative staff, uh, faculty, or their fellow students. And I think, you know, at this public school level and private school level on K through 12, I, I would suggest that, you know, they need to take very strong action to ensure that, uh, safety of everyone involved. And I wish I had an easy answer because a lot of families depend on school for kids getting good interaction. You know, obviously people have to work, they, you know, they need the kids to engage there. Homeschooling is very hard when you're working. Um, and it's hard to sit in front of a computer or video for that many hours at a time. Um, I think people understate how hard it is. You're not watching a movie, people. I mean, you're watching a class and it's no different. You gotta focus. And uh, doing sessions on the phone for seven plus hours, um, listening to debate and listening to the procedures on the phone, you, you have to stay focused through the whole process. And it gets exhausting of staying focused. Yeah, um, I'm sure for the so teachers think, too, it's a challenge, you know. Oh, actually, the teachers have to focus on multiple places at the same time. Yeah. Earlier this week, uh, Taki, as you know, the governor um, 
uh, added some extra money to help uh, restaurants, you know, get through the uh, the cooler months um, that are coming, so they could continue to offer outdoor dining as as long as possible. Do you think that was a good idea? Well, we're trying to hold something together as long as we can while we still can do it. Um, there's a twenty percent death rate already now, according to the Restaurant Association. They'll rise to twenty five soon, and. Uh, you know, one indicator is alcohol licenses for restaurants. Uh, you know, Boston has had a massive turning on licenses back to the city to the tune of 244 available licenses at the end of August. So, you know, people are closing out and they're returning the licenses back to the city, uh, those restaurant liquor licenses. And I do understand that restaurant liquor licenses is not the super majority of restaurants. The super majority of restaurants are not alcohol businesses. We use it as an indicator of where we think the, the industry is going. Uh, because if uh, alcohol-related restaurants are closing permanently, you know, we can kind of guesstimate the um, effect on non-alcohol-related restaurants. Um, so, you know, outdoor seating, you know, when New England, outdoor seating is going to have to end sometime as we are closer to Thanksgiving. Um, and, you know, you've seen on, maybe on the news about these igloos, space heaters, um, I do know that people have like outdoor tops, but it, the outdoor tops is basically being indoors anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, what's your comfort level on a circulated heating system where you got dry air, which cold, which is what this is, coronavirus is a cold virus, uh, thrives in, you know, right around that 60 degree-ish zone, um, indoors, dry air being circulated. And this is where it gets extremely scary. Yeah. Anything else you think the state can do at this point to help uh, small businesses in general? Well, this comes to a funding issue. And, you know, we have an economic development stimulus bill still floating in conference committee to put some, some bond monies to help small businesses. But, I mean, for us, the state to provide you assistance, it won't be cash driven. There'll be very little cash opportunity unless we get some federal money to provide that cash. We're probably going to have to bond some money, and that means going into debt. And nobody likes that you're going to debt. I'm a firm believer of good managing debt. You can manage your debt and do some incredible things. So every time we go take debt away into new debt service, it takes away things like roads and bridges. Because we really, you know, really, really make a strong effort in Massachusetts to control our debt load, to ensure that you know every dollar that goes in goes to something concrete, uh, literally. Um, but you know, in this pandemic situation, we might find ourselves maybe doing more bonding uh, for small businesses um, in the state's debt load will go up. And with the potential debt load increase on unemployment insurance, you know, that, that's a combination that we'll pay the price for you know, down the road. Um, but we may be heading that direction where we're going to face some very um, challenged decisions about basically uh, mortgaging the future to get past today. And uh, I can see it now. Five years now, we're going to get a whole lot of complaints from constituents saying, you know, you should never have done this, you know, stuff. But um, we, we don't have the, I do not have the good fortune of uh, enduring uh, the idea of future complaints when I got a problem now. Right. Do you think um, there'll be extensions on uh, municipalities uh, paying into the their OPEB accounts, you know, their their pension accounts, their their liability accounts? I know that's been happening um, before to, to kind of uh, kick the can down the road a little bit. Do you think that'll happen again? I think there'll be a serious conversation about doing stuff like that again. Uh, once again, that, that extends your municipal uh, debt service uh, and it can hurt retirees if you're uh, actually current retirees should be okay. But if you're a future retiree, well, that's, <laughs> that's a problem. Um, uh, if you're a public employee. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we're going to have to have this conversation continue in the winter about municipal assistance, whether it be holding town elections to helping out uh, setting the next year's budgets. We, we did do a chapter 70 um, amount based on last year's numbers and we got some pandemic money from the feds that we you know, gave the citizen towns as help as part of uh, COVID-19 reopening. But that should be helpful. I, I know where that Quincy had used FY20 numbers and local aid uh, to stabilize their budget. And uh, we were able to do that at our level. We made that commitment for the remember, remainder of FY21. Um, local aid is also income tax dollars. Your tax dollars go straight to citizen towns. Um, 
not sure uh, how that's going to play out exactly. And the lottery is still kind of all over the place. Um, we are a scratch ticket lottery. It's about 65-ish plus of our sales. I expect that should come out strong as we head the holidays because people love to give scratch tickets away. The keynote continues to worry me a lot because the bars aren't open. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have restaurants that are open that has bars and keynote, so you can play keynote from your table outside. Um, and uh, you can get the numbers off the TV screen. I'm sure they can arrange the screen somehow. Or, or they just take the wait stuff and take your ticket and scan it at the bar and bring it back. Um, but Kino is a significant portion of our uh, lottery income, which also goes back to say you know, it's about 15%. So, you know, we'll wait and see. And the multi-state lottery also took a hit because multi-state lotteries, other COVID states, you know, don't have as much lottery play, which reduces the prize pool. People got used to seeing a half billion dollar multi-state prize pool. But that, you know, as the economy is slow to reopen around the state, you see those prize pools go up and people want to participate. And of course, you got that employment problem, people can't pay. Well, honestly, you should be playing a lottery if, if you have other priorities. So, you know, we will have to have more conversations with municipalities regarding um, further assistance as we move into the winter time and town elections. And it isn't that far away. Think about it. It's, it's only around about five months uh, to the towns and cities to start the budget planning. And we only, we're about three months away from when we start a budget planning by FY22. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, well, speaking of elections, of course, there's one coming up uh, November 3rd. And uh, you found out some interesting uh, information about um, uh, absentee balloting and how that applies uh, uh, regarding the, the uh, Constitution. Yeah, you gave me homework last time we talked. <laughs> so, uh, And you did it. <laughs> I did it. I did a little poking around. And the Constitution sets up absentee balloting. That is actually very interesting. It allows a religious exemption, so you can't vote because of religious reasons. You can do absentee ballot if you're physically not in the state. Um, and if you have um, uh, physically in state, uh, medical emergency, and then you have some kind of impairment, physical, quote, unquote, disability that impedes you from getting uh, to the polls. So the legislature and the governor uh, threaded a really fine needle called COVID-19 as a physical disability. A state of emergency, uh, you know, is what we're using them on with the governor, state of emergency still. What we're calling COVID-19 is a physical disability that can impede you from going to the polls. Now, people think of physical disability as a, as a medical ailment, but that's not always the case. If you have a, uh, any reason you can't get into the polling location, let's say, um, you know, you have a, a broken leg, you know, a, a medical reason, but a physical impairment can be things like being in jail, uh, which is not always my favorite example, but if you're a misdemeanor crime, you do not lose your rights to vote. You can vote um, in the county jail uh, in for a Quincy election by asking for an absentee ballot uh, because it's not a felony crime, it's a misdemeanor crime. So that's a demonstration of physically unable to go to the polls. You know, people think hospital bed, but there's more right. than things. For example, jury duty. If there's jury duty election that you've been physically impaired from going to the polls. So if you're in Dedham Courthouse, and you're a dead on resident, and it turns into just like awful trial where you're in there for like 10 hours, um, and you can't get to the polls that day, you uh, can get an absentee ballot, even though you're physically in the town, but you're physically impaired. So we're calling COVID-19 a physical impairment uh, because of the danger of being outside. Uh, but that's because of the governor's state of emergency. If we want to do mail-in ballots permanently, which I'm getting a lot of email for, which apparently the advocates should probably read the Constitution, we're going to need a constitutional amendment change. And I anticipate somebody, whether by ballot petition or by legislation, will file a bill next year to do that. And for those who, are, who don't know about ballot petitions of, or uh, legislation that changed the Constitution, you need the legislature to approve that question in two separate legislative sessions then put it before the voters. So under an ideal situation, the first chance you can vote on this is 2024, mm -hmm. in an ideal situation. Right. But I think people generally like it. Quincy has about 10,000 mail-in ballot requests, you know, uh, nearly a million statewide. Um, it had an extremely high turnout. 1.7 million people uh, took up prim a primary ballot this year. So, you know, it, it seems to be very advantageous to folks um, to do so. So... 
I think it's worthy of conversation, and I'm sure uh, we're going to get people emailing and calling my office, weighing in on their opinion. Yeah, and uh, for a city election, there'd need to be, a, I guess, a new ordinance, right? A uh, new law in the city to allow mail-in balloting for municipal elections. Yeah, I, I don't know the city charter, but I suspect, uh, and town charters, if you live in the town, I suspect that people are going to have to go review their charters about uh, conducting mail-in balloting if they so desire to do so, and the costs associated with it. Sure. Uh, you know, the self-address envelope and such. Uh, but, I mean, I think that's something that the municipalities would have to look at their own charters and decide um, how to go about it, and, or whether or not their charters has to follow the state constitution. That's, I haven't um, looked into that level of legal death, but I'm sure the city and town solicitors should really get on it. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, you know, to, to see where it goes uh, from here. So another, um, you know, another uh, landmark change caused by the, the pandemic, the things that will be lasting, uh, ho- hopefully post-pandemic. Exactly. It's like telemedicine has become, going to be, is permanent. We're still evolving it by regulation. And we, but we, you know, we have a bill and conference committee to do telemedicine. And uh, the governor's emergency rates continue to evolve a little here, a little there as the uh, both community health centers, you know, the various private doctors groups, as well as um, the hospitals are, are still rolling this technology out. Urgent care centers have taken a whole new role with COVID-19, as well as places like CVS on testing. Um, and uh, insurance companies have to adjust to a COVID-19 world as well. So, you know, healthcare is something on COVID that's going to make a permanent change in our lives in terms of how we do uh, medical care. And mm-hmm. You're right. There'll be other things as we go along to learn. Uh, works out pretty well, but beyond a medical crisis. So, you know, it's it's uh, once again innovation caused by necessity. What do you think about um, the governor's mandate for flu shots for uh, for students? Yeah, I get some anti-flu shot emails now, and the reality is that you get like five different immunizations already prior to going to school. Um, I'm a bit older now, so I don't remember exactly what was involved, but I do understand that parents have to demonstrate, I think, five different immunizations. Um, I did a little look at my medical records online and realized I'm overdue for for some booster shots. Um, So, you know, I think the flu vaccine uh, has a very small number of people that have had negative impact, but people use those minute cases as a reason why we should all should not get it, despite the fact it's a highly tested, decades-old uh, vaccine. And uh, people, I, I read emails, I read this stuff, and it's completely non-medical science. They're just taking anything off the internet and saying it's true. And it's not the consensus of the medical community. Uh, scientific stuff is peer-reviewed. It goes through a lot of years of looked at by other people to reach a consensus on, you know, what is the uh, ground basis of science. Uh, people just think that you make one inclusion and it's the end of the game. This is not how science works in the 21st century or the 20th century. So we need to take the flu shot. I mean, I need to get mine, you know, hit the CVS, you know, Walgreens or go to my doctor's office. I'm going to make a time to do that uh, myself. Uh, If you have a flu shot, it reduces the symptoms or protects you from the flu. It reactivates your antibodies to know to look for the flu because your antibodies, your body does not always keep a memory of the flu, the flu strains, the flu does change, like COVID-19 is already changing on, on slight strain changes, which the flu vaccine has to keep up with. And um, it, particularly with COVID-19, if you had the flu shot, you can start ruling out uh, potential uh, diseases uh, associated with your symptoms. So, you know, a lot of the COVID-19 symptoms look like the common code in the flu and the neurovirus. So if you have a flu shot, you can start kind of like whittling down your options on maybe you do have those symptoms or not. And uh, those who have dealt with me through winter months know I get a level of bronchitis once we get to the dry, cold weather. And uh, this is a reoccurring part of my life since I was about 33, so well into 15 plus years. And um, uh, you know, that the COVID-19 scares me too because... As a person, you know, very, very vulnerable to bronchitis, you know, and this is a respiratory disease, I, you know, I'm also extremely concerned uh, about this. And the flu shot's crucial for me to uh, ensure that I can eliminate the flu as one of my possible uh, ailments when I, um, you know, pick up a, a respiratory disease. Sure. 
at the end of the time for us today, Tacky, but I always like to ask you about the census uh, before we go. Sure. Um, I got a couple of little updates. Uh, one, actually, I'll, I'll brought really fast is our federal delegation uh, got us some uh, CDGB money, Community Development Block money related to COVID money from the CARES Act. So the city's getting one point one million ish dollars, one million one hundred seventy six or one hundred thirteen dollars from the feds to help with COVID nineteen relief uh, from the federal government. Uh, Senator Warren, Senator Markey, and Congressman Lynch have worked very hard on the CARES Act, but also to uh, get as much money as we can back to the city and the state. So that's good news for the uh, city of Quincy to get some more COVID assistance money. As for the census, we're continuing to do better. Um, U.S. Census self-reporting 65.6%. Massachusetts at 68.1%. We're well ahead of the curve. We're actually uh, very well ahead of the curve compared to last week. We picked up uh, about 0.7-ish percent more, or 0.5% more. Quincy continues to grow at 6.79%. But our neighbors around us continue to also grow. Weymouth's at 74.1%. We picked up another a tenth of a point. Braintree's at 78.64%. Randolph at 69.8%. Milton at 81.9%. So, you know, the South Shore region are, are, is doing very well in self reporting. Um, again, the census workers are out making phone calls and visiting you. They have your lanterns on, they're social distance. They'll never ask for money. That's, you know, They'll never ask for money. They'll never threaten you with deportation or um, potential loss of government benefits if you don't participate. They'll never uh, call police action on you for non-participation. So again, uh, you know, remind the audience there are a lot of scams going on and uh, unfortunately that's ruthless people are trying to take advantage of people's fears, especially the deportation issue. I mean, I, you know, this, is, this is a very common one right now in the current political environment trying to scare uh, new citizens, uh, permanent residents, and even people undocumented from not participating in the census. But uh, self-reporting is very high, um, so it makes it easier for the door-to-door -door people and our, all our safety uh, to try to reduce the amount of people they need to visit you to remind you to go to the census. So you can still do this at 2020 census.gov. October 31st is the deadline this year. Uh, the closer you get to 100% reporting, it's important for uh, $1.5 trillion in funding. In the case of the city of Quincy, we crack 100,000. It changes our CDBG money form immensely down at U.S. HUD. So it is essential that you count everyone in your household. All right. Good to see you, Tacky. And uh, again, nice haircut. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I look forward to seeing you another week. Uh, it will grow a little bit longer next time. <laughs> All right. Take care. Mm -hmm.